glory to the Lamb, for His name is Jesus. He heals all my diseases. Wherever God's people are found, wherever prayer does abound, the glory of the Lord will shine upon us. We can be free and feel His power, so lift your hands in this hour. So today, I want to share with you a very powerful thing that the Lord gave me uh, a couple of months ago. I woke up one morning and this verse, Psalms 126, verses 1 through 6, if we have that, uh, we can show it. If we don't, it's okay. But Psalms 126, verses 1 through 6, if you'd like to read with me this morning. Hallelujah. <clears throat> when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. There's the scripture right up here. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are sad. We are, hallelujah, we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Father, thank you for your precious Holy Spirit today. Thank you for your spirit that has already been evident, and we have felt you here today. Kiss this service with your presence and let the power of God move and minister in the hearts of people. Build faith in us, I pray in Jesus' powerful name. And everybody said... Amen. You can be seated. The Bible states emphatically here, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. This is a picture like a farmer that goes out to sow a seed and that surely the harvest will come in. But this is a spiritual harvest and a spiritual sowing. And it even tells the type of prayer that is going to bring in a harvest. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. It reminds me of the verse that says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? It avails much. Not the casual or careless prayer or occasional prayer, but those that go out in tears, that sow in intensity and in earnestness, those who are serious in their relationship with God, those that have every confidence that God answers prayer and he will never fail, those that sow in tears, they pray with tears, their emotion, their heart, their spirit is involved. When you pray like that, you're going to reap joy. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. When the Lord gave me this verse, he spoke it to me prophetically. And he said, I have caused you and the church to sow in tears for many years. And it's not been just a blanket sowing, but it's been very, very pinpointed. It's been a very focused prayer. And that is that God would send his glory and his power and the manifestation of his presence back to the earth again and there would be a great multitude harvest of souls. God put this in my heart so many years ago. And he put me on the track to pray the prayers of God, do what you have promised. You have promised over and over that you're going to send 
glory on the earth one more time. You've given us words, Lord, and you've spoken to me, not only to my heart and in dreams and visions, but to my wife in dreams and visions. You've spoken to select people in the church in dreams and visions. You've spoken to guest speakers that have graced this pulpit and have preached for many years that God has something special for you. God has an appointment with this church. God has a day when he's going to reckon all the tears that have gone, all the sowing that's been given, and he's going to bring about a harvest, a mighty harvest of souls. It's going to happen, and God has put that upon us. I remember the last time Brother Abonio came uh, in 2018, he said to me, I told my wife before I left to come to America that this man, Chambers, and his church is amazing that so many years they've been able to beat the same drum, pray the same prayer, believe the same word, and they've embraced it and they believe it as much today as the day it was given 20 years ago. That's not natural, folks. That's spiritual. That's not something that just drummed up in the mind of a person You've had all kinds of ideas of things in your own flesh before, and you know it lasts about a day or a week. But when God puts something in you, it doesn't leave. When God speaks into your heart, it doesn't go away. When God puts something in you, he won't leave you alone until you pray the prayer that he has put in the form of a promise in front of you. Hallelujah. And all of the prayer meetings for the 20-plus years uh, that we've been praying about what God is going to send, what God has promised, the glory of God to manifest in the earth. There has been so many times, so many prayer revivals through the last 20 years, so many times when we've met together on Saturday night. I remember so many, many times when in the past years there's been 60 to 100 people that would come up here on Saturday and pray and seek the face of God. People would come and and wait upon the Lord and yearn for God and they would receive visions and dreams and words from heaven. And these words are not uh, neglected and they're not relegated to the trash heap. They are relevant. They are current. They are powerful. They are coming to pass because God is not a man that he would lie nor the son of man that he should repent. And if God makes a promise, God keeps his word. He honors his word above his name. Nobody ever in history, in eternity past, has ever been able to make God out a liar. Not even one time has he been proved a liar. And if God speaks a word, if God tells you to sow in tears over something, then he is surely going to bring it to pass. Those that sow in tears will reap in joy. Those he who continually goes forth weeping. Notice the type of prayer. It, it describes that this is not casual prayer and it's not occasional, but he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing. Hallelujah. What is the seed for sowing? It's our prayer and we're sowing into the soil of the world and we're letting God do his thing unknown to man, underground, behind the scenes, in the dark. God is doing things that we're not even aware of and we've been doing this for a long time. And when the Lord woke me up a few weeks ago and this was rolling around in my soul, I got so excited. I mean, I've known Psalms 126, verse 6, for so many years. But when God gives you a fresh revelation, it just lights you up like a light bulb. And you go, wow, I, I see this in a brand new direction. I see a new revelation of what God has said. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so the prayer is not occasional, but it's continual. Everyone say continual. It's continual prayer. We, 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 we won't leave God alone and God won't leave us alone. We won't leave him alone because we want him to fulfill his promise. And he won't leave us alone because he wants us to keep praying that he'll fulfill his promise. God puts things in people that you can't get away from. I could no more abandon the word that God has given me than I could abandon the ministry or abandon Jesus. He put it there and he's going to consummate it and bring it to pass. And if God put it there, it'll happen. Somebody say praise the Lord. 
I don't care what we have to go through. I don't care if you have to get COVID. I don't care if it sweeps across the nation and around the world. I don't care how many people die from it. I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care if the, the different president got in power. I don't care what legislation he signs. I don't care what he thinks about God. I don't care what he thinks about the church. It doesn't matter what he has to know is that God is in control of this planet and God rules and reigns. He sets up kings and he puts them down and this planet is going exactly the way it's supposed to go. It's doing the exact thing that God wants it to do. If God didn't want it, it wouldn't be there. If God didn't allow it, it wouldn't happen. But God has done this because God rules on planet earth. He rules everybody. He rules all the nations. He rules over all the kingdoms. He sets up and puts down at his will. Don't you think for one minute that Lucifer is in control of anything? He's a defeated, destroyed angel that will be on a hook in hell forever and ever. He's going to burn in the pit of fire just like every unbeliever. But God's word will continue. God's promises will come to pass. And I don't know if you believe it or not, but all we got to have is one that believes it. And this preacher believes it. And as long as I believe, God will come through and do what he has promised. He is going to do what he has promised. Somebody say amen. The path in 21 is going to be tough and it's going to be rough and there's going to be challenges. And if you think we're out of the woods, brother, we're just getting into the woods. We're just getting into some trouble. But in the middle of it all, God's word stands as a tower, a sentinel of truth. God's word stands and it cannot be annulled by the devil or by anybody else. Some give the Lord a hand clap for that. Hallelujah. It's going to come to pass. We're bearing seed for sowing. He who continually goes forth, weep, weeping, bearing seed for sowing. We, we continually, we continue in this. And then I love the end of it. Here's the stinger. Shall doubtless, everybody say doubtless. No doubt. Doubtless. No doubt. Everybody say no doubt. No doubt. doubt. We're going to come again. Hallelujah. Amen. The church's finest hour is not behind us. It's in front of us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to come again. Everybody say come again. Hallelujah. With rejoicing. Bring in our sheaves with us. Show the picture, please, if you would, of sheaves of wheat. And all it is is a big field. All it is is a big field, and those are all sheaves, big bundles of wheat right there. Thousands and thousands of them. Wheat that's all bundled up in a big ball. That's what the Bible calls sheaves. We're going to bring the sheaves in. Somebody say man. There's a whole lot more sheaves coming in than seed that was planted. Somebody say man. So what do we say to this? We say keep sowing. Keep believing. Keep praying. Don't be discouraged. You're doubtless, you're doubtless going to come again. If you don't give up in the battle, if you don't quit in the storm, if you don't let the devil beat you down, if you don't listen to the enemy of your soul who always is telling you that God has not God is not going to come through and God's word is going to be made invalid. Friend, stand your ground and keep believing. Stand your ground and keep praying. Stand your ground. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what circumstances we go through. God's going to keep his word. Hallelujah. There is a move of the Holy Spirit that is coming that is unprecedented. It's greater than what happened in the book of Acts and it's going to go, it's going to circle this globe and it's it's going to bring in a world harvest of sheaves of souls that are going to come in. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap for this. This is the promise of God. Don't get your eyes on the news and the government. Get your eyes on what God has said and what God is getting ready to do and ask God to let you be a part of it. Hallelujah. Doubtless we're going to come again with rejoicing. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Everybody say, I'm not done yet, devil. No, sir, you've been battling me, knocking me down. Amen. My wife didn't get COVID, but she got attacked uh, in her body, and she's been in a lot of pain. And uh, I prayed for and asked God, give her strength for the journey. The devil's doing everything he can physically, spiritually, and every other way, circumstantially, to beat us down and knock us down, make you be full of fear. Somebody say amen. The other day, I woke up and all these thoughts, negative thoughts, began to attack me, and I began to feel fear. And the Holy Ghost said, kill your pride right now. And I said, well, God, that, that, that wasn't pride. That was fear. He said, fear is pride. Mm. When you have fear, it's a manifestation of your pride. And I said, why? He said, because you're thinking about what's going to happen to you. You're worried about you. It's all about me, God. I need to be comfortable. No, you need to be challenged. And we need to lose our pride. Come on, somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. I mean, God's been working me over with this, telling me, stop it. That's just pride. And you know the other one he's been showing me over and over and over again? <laughs> amen. Is impatience. He said fear and impatience are manifestations of pride in your life. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Isn't it amazing how impatience is so easy to manifest? Isn't it amazing such a little provocation can cause such a big reaction? One driver who doesn't have a driver's license can ruin your day. Amen. One clerk that runs out of paper for the printer and has to go through the store and find the manager and find this and find that can ruin your day. If you are impatient, you are a proud dude. You got a lot of pride. Come on, somebody say man. Somebody say man. Somebody say man. Hallelujah. I was in a store the other day and they couldn't find the product and then they found it and then it was the wrong deal and then they had to go search again and, and I finally said, listen, let me stand over here and wait till you can figure it out. And they said, okay. And so they were gone about 15, 20 minutes. Finally, they come back and they said, we're sorry, we just don't have it and we're just so sorry that we imposed on your time. I said, no problem. That is no problem. And I thought, I am not going to fail again. Somebody say amen. I mean, really, 20 minutes? Your time is so valuable that if you lose 20 minutes, it's going to kill your day? You're so important. They're waiting on your signature. They're waiting on your decision. You are so important that 20 minutes is going to ruin you? No, 20 minutes is going to make you into a person of God that's humble and obedient. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. You might as well laugh about it because you know it's true. The Lord gave me this to preach to you, saints. And this, this account that I give to you is about a revival that came between 1949 and 1952 in the Hebrides Islands off the coast of Scotland. And the things that a man, I found a man who was there who wrote a firsthand account and the Lord said, give this to the church and let them know these same principles will be played out at full gospel. Because when God does something, the earmark of what God does is always there, wherever it's at. There was a small cottage in the city of Barvis on the island of Lewis. By the way, this island of Lewis, Scotland, is where Donald Trump's mom was born. And in 1820, this island began to pray, and they had a revival. And, and when she was 17 years old, just after the turn of the century, she moved to America, but she was raised in an atmosphere of revival, and she knew God. 
But it's interesting that in 1949, there were two sisters who lived together in a little cottage, Peggy and Christine Smith. One was 84 and the other one was 82. The older one, Peggy, was blind, completely blind, and her sister was almost bent double with arthritis. And unable to attend the public worship in, this, in their village, their house just became a sanctuary where they met with God. And they were praying one day for God to send a move of his spirit on the Hebrides Islands. And when they prayed one day, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And when God gave them that word, they knew it was a prophetic word, so they prayed it every day. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. They pleaded this day and night, week after week, month after month. And one night, Peggy had a revelation that revival was coming, that God had heard the prayer of the people. She sent for the minister and asked him to organize the deacons into a prayer meeting. And one night as they were waiting upon God, a young deacon rose and read part of the 24th Psalm. Now this is before the glory broke forth. And the 24th Psalm said, Who shall ascend into the hill of God? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord. And turning to the others, he said, Brethren, it seems to me that what we are doing is just so much humbug to be waiting and praying as we are. If we cleanse ourselves, and get completely right with God, will he not answer us? Then lifting his hands toward heaven, he cried, O oh God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? He got no further than that statement, and he was knocked down by the power of God to the floor, and everyone there fell under the power. And it turned the corner in the move of God on those islands because those men had a supernatural stream of power that was let loose in their lives because they prayed a prayer of cleansing. Why is it that God won't send revival? Our hearts are not clean. Why is it God won't do great things among us? We're not pure. We have our little dalliances with the enemy. We have our little strongholds. We have our little places where the enemy knows that he can move in our lives. But I tell you this morning, I feel the Holy Ghost wants everybody here to stand. And I want us as the church to pray a pure prayer. I want us to pray Psalms 24, that as we lift our hands toward heaven, we need to ask God, oh God, are my hands clean and is my heart pure? And ask the Holy Ghost to cleanse everything that's unclean and to purify everything that's not pure. Come on, ask God right now. Lord, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? Cleanse me and purify me and make me fit for revival and glory and power that has been promised over and over to this church. In Jesus' name, cleanse us, cleanse us, cleanse us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Cleanse us, God. Cleanse us, God. Purify us, Lord. Hallelujah. Can you say amen this morning? Can you say amen this morning? Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I've got several other things to direct your attention to. Hallelujah. If we get closer to God, we can be directed by the Holy Spirit. How many of you have a desire for the Holy Ghost to speak into your life? How many of you want to be closer so that God can direct you by His Spirit? 
There was an occasion before the glory hit that Peggy sent for the pastor, one of the blind sister, and she asked him to go to a small isolated village to hold a meeting. She said, I was in prayer and God spoke to me to have you go to this village. The pastor protested and said, but I've already tested that village and they are not in favor of revival. They told me they don't want to have God and to get out of town. He explained this and then he questioned the wisdom of her request. He said, besides, Peggy, I don't have any leadings to go to this place. And I'm the pastor. She turned in the direction of his voice and her sightless eyes seemed to penetrate his soul. And she said, Pastor, if you were living as near to God as you ought to be, he would reveal his secrets to you also. The pastor felt like a subordinate being being reprimanded by a general. He humbly accepted the rebuke as from the Lord. And Peggy said, let's pray together. And as she prayed, she said, Lord, you remember what you told me this morning that in this village you're going to save seven men and these seven men will become pillars in this church. Lord, I've given you the message to the pastor and it seems he is not prepared to receive it. I wonder how many messages the Holy Ghost is speaking to us and we're not prepared to receive it. Oh, Lord, give him wisdom because he badly needs it. <laughs> All right, the pastor said, I'll go to the village. And when he got there, he found a crowd was already assembled. And that as he preached, they came and got him and broke in on his sermon and said, you need to pray. There are some men outside the house that couldn't get in because of the crowd. And he said, well, I'll, I'll pray for them later. They said, they need prayer now. And he went outside and there were seven men standing there shaking and weeping and crying out to God because of their sins. These men were one to the Lord instantly and became pillars in the church on the island of Lewis. Somebody say amen. amen. Folks, we got to hear from God. We've got to hear from God. We need to hear from God. Let's get closer so we can be directed. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In this revival, when it broke out, there was young people that were used in mass in this revival. Teenagers. There was a 15-year-old boy named Donald. And uh, one day the pastor went over to see Donald because he was so impressed with his walk with God. He found him in the barn behind his house and he was praying. And Donald said to the pastor, excuse me a little, pastor, I'm having an audience with the king. And this boy prayed all the time. They were in one meeting somewhere and there was a blockage in the spirit world. They said the people couldn't receive what the preacher was preaching. This pastor was struggling and struggling and struggling and he looked on the front row and there was Donald. And he looked at Donald and he could see that Donald was under the power of God. And he said, Donald, stand up and say what God has shown you. Donald stood up and said, I seem to be gazing through an open door. I see the Lamb of God in the midst of the throne with the keys of death and hell at his girdle. He began to sob, then lifting his eyes toward heaven, he said, Oh God, there is power there. Let it loose. And with the force of a hurricane, the Spirit of God swept through that building. The floodgates of heaven were opened in an instant. They said the church resembled a battlefield. People were laying out under, everywhere under the power of the Holy Spirit on their face, prostrate before the Lord because a 15-year-old was used of God. That's going to happen again. And when the teenage bunch get a hold of God, there's going to be mighty power. Somebody say amen. 
Here's another manifestation of the glory of God in revival. Trances. Trances. You said, but I, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit all these years, and I know everything there is to know about the Holy Ghost. You haven't even touched it. Amen? And I was thinking, as I read this account of a trance, there was a young woman in the church, in particular, that was repeatedly used in trances. She would fall out under the power and go into a trance, and she would receive things from the Lord, and she would pass them on, to the pastor. One night she fell in a trance and when she got done, she came to the pastor and said, I saw a young married woman in the next village. I saw where she lives. It's 20 miles away. And if you will go past her and pray for her, she will be saved and delivered from an evil spirit. The pastor went the next day, found the directions just like she had said. The woman was sitting in there with her newborn baby. He prayed for her. She was saved and delivered from a demon and became a part of the kingdom of God. Why? Because a young woman was used by the Holy Ghost in trances. Now you see, when, when, a, when you fall into the power of God like that, you know, the Holy Ghost is in control. You don't get to come up here and pray for two minutes and look at your watch and say, i got to go. The Spirit of God's going to take you over. Amen? I remember in the past I've seen people in our church falling into trances. One of them was, was Libby Cox. And I remember when she had an experience, she was laying right up here on the floor. And she fell out under the power and she had her hands lifted straight to heaven and she stared at the ceiling for an hour and a half. She never moved for an hour and a half. If you don't think that's spiritual, just lay down and lift up your hands and see how long you can hold them up. An hour and a half, I couldn't believe it. And she was just staring at the ceiling. I knew she wasn't seeing the ceiling. When she got up, she was a changed person. She had been delivered, and the power of God was in a new place in her life. Somebody say, somebody say amen. Another one that I saw one time was Ada Feliciano, who was on this side. And on a Sunday service, she came down for prayer. And she had to have a miracle because she had a tumor suspended on her optic nerve in her left eye. And it was growing. It started the size of a raisin. Now it was already the size of a grape. And they said, we've got to take that tumor out of your eye, but you're going to go blind in your left eye. There's no way to save your sight. She came up here. I prayed for her. She screamed a bloody scream. I thought she died. She fell on her back, same thing, had her hands lifted for over an hour. But when she got up, she came to me and said, I felt piercing pain in the left side of my temple. I thought it killed me. It was so strong. But she said, I can still see. She goes back to the doctor. The, the optic nerve is perfect, and the tumor has disappeared. She was under a trance for an hour by the power of God. Folks, this is... This is a little tiny taste of what's coming. Somebody say amen. I mean, you're going you're gonna to come to church on Sunday morning, and you're going to see people laying out everywhere, and they're all going to be in trances, and they're all going to receive heaven's, heaven's rewards. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. When the glory comes, church as usual is forever done away with. We're going to come up here and we're not going to know from one Sunday to the next what God's going to do, what God's going to accomplish. Somebody say amen. So don't be afraid to let God use you. Don't be afraid of the power of the Spirit. Don't be afraid to yield to the Holy Ghost. This came out of this glory of God that came to this island in the Hebrides. Here's another one. There was a man who was a part of this revival, part of the church. And he was a butcher in town. 
And uh, he asked for the people to come to his house and to have a prayer meeting. And so a bunch of the men of the, of, of the church came to his house. And so uh, the butcher knelt down and started praying. And all the other people in the house heard him praying because he prayed real loud. And they marveled at his discernment and worldwide vision from this tiny little northwestern island off the coast of Scotland. And they asked him after the prayer meeting, what in the world were you doing praying for Greece? How come you weren't praying for somebody in the church or somebody on the island? Said you just kept interceding for Greece. Said, are you Greek? He said, no. Well, have you ever been to Greece? He said, no. Well, do you know anyone in Greece? He said, no. Well, what were you doing? He said, I was following the leading of the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody say amen. How many of you would like to be used like this where you knew that you were doing business for the king because you were following the leading of the Holy Spirit? Oh, I marvel at how the Holy Ghost uses me. How that he gives me words. How he gave me this message. How he woke me up with Psalms 126 and started telling me, you've been sowing, son, for many years. The harvest is coming. Don't you think it's not? I'm going to give you the harvest. I marvel at how the Lord brings people's faces to me when I'm praying, and I know that I'm to intercede for those people. I marvel at how God speaks to my heart and shows me things and reveals things to my life. Oh, don't you want that? I said, don't you want that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Two years later, the pastor was introduced to a man in Dublin who told him this story. He had gone to Greece on a business trip and was asked to speak to a church where there was a lot of people. The Spirit of God worked so powerfully that he continued preaching for weeks and weeks in this church. Signs, wonders, miracles of the Lord, and thousands were added to the kingdom in this city in Greece. The pastor compared the dates that two years earlier the man in his church had prayed for Greece and they discovered that the movement of God in that city began on the same day that the butcher was on his knees praying for Greece. Come on. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. Hallelujah. The devil says you're wasting time. The devil says your prayers are going no higher than your head. The devil says it's all a waste of energy. No, nothing that's prayed in the Spirit is a waste of energy. Every time we pray in the Holy Ghost, we're hitting the target. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand together.